Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seminar. People are still joining us. So I just want to welcome you and I will help you orient yourselves to the webinar platform in just one minute, but welcome. Okay, so um, welcome everyone to the second webinar in a series hosted by the Island Institute. Um, we are using a webinar platform and I just wanted to show you one slide on how to use this platform. So we'll be taking your questions today at the end of the presentation and you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You just click on that and you can type in your questions and we will be able to hear from you there. So we invite your questions and are looking forward to hearing them later. So my name is Jennifer Seavey and I'm the Chief Programs Officer here at the Island Institute. And we wanna thank you all for joining this, our second webinar in a series that is addressing January storm and the larger issue of coastal flooding in Maine. So for those of you who do not know the Island Institute very well, our mission is to help island and coastal communities thrive and to share what we are learning, especially uh, with respect to climate change and climate science and preparation, which we're going to address today. So I wanna introduce our panelists. Our first panelist is Susie Arnold. And Susie is a chief sci ocean scientist and the director of the Center for Climate and Communities here at the Island Institute. Susie in this role leads a team to help coastal and island communities build climate resilience through mitigation, adaptation and policy. She is also an appointee to Maine's Climate Council, where she serves as the co-chair to the Scientific and uh, Technical Subcommittee and uh, serves on the Coastal and Marine Working Group. She earned a master's degree in marine policy and a doctoral degree in marine biology from the University of Maine. We're also welcoming Hannah Baranis. Hannah is a coastal scientist in the Climate Center at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Her focus is characterizing coastal flood risks in a way that's translatable to local and state level decision making. Her ongoing projects include installing tide gauges with the help of community science programs to improve flood forecasting. She's also developing flood risk assessment tools for working waterfronts and doing statistical modeling on water level in tidal rivers. She's also a member of Maine Climates Council, the technical scientific and technical subcommittee. And she received a undergraduate degree in earth sciences from Dartmouth and a master's and a PhD in geosciences from the University of Massachusetts. And then our third panelist today is Gabe McPhail. Gabe leads the mission-centered company, Resilient Communities, which assists primarily rural, coastal, and island communities with resilience planning and projects. Their work focuses on climate adaptation and mitigation, as well as economic, social, and environmental sustainability through community planning, securing funding, and uh, project management. Gabe resides on Vinyl Haven, where she supports the town with long-term planning and is a member of the Sea Level Rise and Climate Committee. And Gabe's a regional coordinator for Maine's uh, Community Resilience Partnership and serves on both the Coastal and Marine Working Group and the Equity Subcommittees in the Maine Climate Council. So thank you all three of you for joining us today. So we are here in light of those back-to-back -back coastal storms this month and their devastating impact. And we thought it'd be useful to spend some time with the three of you, scientists and community planners, to gain a better understanding of what just happened, what to expect moving forward and how to prepare. So Susie, I'm gonna start with you. So we've heard a lot about these storms being unusual and maybe a sign of things to come under climate change. 
What do you think about how that the discussion is occurring right now? Sure, and I think uh, Emma's going to share a slide, but while she does that, I just wanted to recognize that while we're over two weeks out from these storms earlier this month, uh, while many people are moving on, the, those on the coast, particularly those that lost property or uh, suffered great destruction of their property are um, still rebuilding, obviously, and building with greater resilience is certainly on top of mind. Um, I just also wanted to acknowledge that while not the specific topic of Today's event, uh, I wanted to acknowledge the severe storm that happened on December 18th and the extreme impacts that were felt by that storm across the state. So getting back to your question about the two coastal storms, uh, these were these were severe events and Hannah's gonna talk to you a little bit later on. Um, they're basically, we're talking about 25 to 90 year return periods. Uh, the back-to-back -back nature of them was very unlikely, and, and she'll get into a little bit more about the probabilities of reoccurrence. Um, however, these are the, the new types of extreme events that we do need to prepare for. Uh, I do think it's appropriate to talk about these storms in the context of climate change. Uh, they, they both were particularly destructive because of a confluence of climate-related influences, um, all occurring after 2023, which was the hottest year on record. So those warmer temperatures caused the ground, for instance, and for instance, to not be frozen. So with that saturated ground and um, watersheds that were very high, we saw um, extreme flooding on top of uh, rising sea levels and precipitation. Um, so really, there was this kind of confluence of events of events that that caused them. Um, to be such extreme events that we can expect to see more of. Uh, and like I said, Hannah's gonna be talking about how sea level rise plays into that a little bit um, going forward. Um, I wanted to just bring to your attention on the left here, we, we've, been, we've been hearing about more uh, storms coming in from the Southeast. So these Southeast winds are particularly punishing to the main coast. And what you're seeing here in the left-hand figure is uh, wave heights caused by those strong winds during the two events. So the first bump is from January 10th, and the second bump is from that January 13th storm. And these wave heights are taken from three offshore buoys. I've circled them in the, the, the map up on the top left, the red being kind of off of York. Um, and then you can see buoy E and buoy I, up, uh, buoy I being more off of uh, MDI. So some extreme wave heights adding to um, Kind of this confluence of events. On the right, you're looking at water levels in Portland. Again, Hannah's going to talk a little bit more about these, but these are compared to the 78 storm, which was uh, our 100-year storm. What's not shown here is the possibility of what we've been warning about, which would be really considered a superstorm in Maine, which would be our record surge of like 4.8 feet on top of a king tide, which Hannah will define later on. Uh, resulting in water levels about two feet higher than what we saw on that Saturday storm. So both storms were record breaking in, in some locations, for example, Bar Harbor broke records one right after another. Uh, Portland broke broke the record on, on Saturday. So certainly extreme events that I do think um, we need to, whether they're the new normal or not is, is probably not true having them back to back, but I do think that, you know, the, the impacts that we've been seeing from all three of these storms are severe and something that we need to prepare for. Excellent. Thank you so much, Susie. So as you kind of alluded to in your answer there, these storms, each one of them is a combination of elements. And let's break down those elements and specifically talk about sea level rise. So Hannah, tell us, like, give us the basics on like, what is sea level rise? How, how is it? What's causing it? How does it potentially combine with these storms and influence these storms? Yeah, thanks. Um, so sea level is playing, um, or sea level is rising as a direct result of changing climate, like Susie mentioned. And sea level rise also played a key role in making the flooding from these two events so severe. Um, so this figure that just popped up on the slide is showing both measured and projected sea level in Portland. So the black sort of squiggly line at the left is showing the annual average sea level 
that has been measured at the Portland tide gauge from the from about 1910 until present. And so far, we've seen about seven and a half inches of sea level rise over the past little bit over 100 years. And historically, sea level rise has been mostly caused by two factors. So first, as the ocean warms, water expands and it takes up more space. Um, and then second is direct meltwater contributions from melting glaciers. So far, we actually haven't seen much of a contribution to sea level rise from melting of the big ice sheets that sit over the North Pole, so that's Greenland, and over the South Pole, so that's East and West Antarctica. But then if you look at projected sea level, so that, that blue shaded area extending from 2024 out to 2150 is kind of the range of possible amounts of future sea level rise within the scenario that Maine has adopted um, as a part of its planning. Um, and a key thing that sticks out there is the acceleration in sea level rise. So that sea level is projected to start rising faster and faster. And that's not a reflection of warming projected, of projected warming becoming faster and faster. It's that there's a possibility that we might start crossing these tipping points where the ice sheets, so Greenland, East and West Antarctica, start melting much more rapidly than we've seen historically. Um, and within that blue shaded area, those two black circles are showing the numbers that um, hopefully a bunch of you are familiar with by now, which is Maine having decided to commit to manage a foot and a half of sea level rise in 2050 and four feet in 2100 relative to the year 2000. And with the new Maine Climate Council report that'll come out, you'll see us sort of re-emphasizing those numbers as good planning targets. Okay, so let's talk about um, sea level rise in these storms. So if we zoom in on that black line or measured annual sea level, um, can you please flip the slide? So that figure on the left is just a zoom in of observed sea level uh, on the black line of what was shown before. And so you can see that in 2023, so also likely in January of 2024, when both of the storms hit, sea level was higher than it's ever been. And that's in part because of that long-term increase in sea level that we just talked about. But another factor here is you can see that sea level varies year to year. Um, and those are the wiggles that you're seeing um, in that black line. And in 2023, and likely still now, we're at kind of the peak of one of those wiggles. Um, and that year to year variation in sea level is generally caused by large scale weather patterns that influence sea level pressure and prevailing winds and currents in the Gulf of Maine. We don't know exactly what's causing the high sea level anomaly that we're seeing right now. Um, we'll sort of have to collect more data in order to figure it out. But anyhow, we are at a peak in variation in annual average sea level. Um, so in total, the two January storms were, as Susie mentioned, were some of the highest water levels we've ever recorded in the past hundred years. And depending on where you were along the coast, one of the storms or the other of the storms, or maybe both, might have been ranked first, second, or third in terms of highest water levels ever recorded. So in trying to get a sense for well, what was the impact of sea level on making those events so bad versus what was the impact of the storms themselves being severe. Um, it's helpful maybe to ask, how would the January flooding compare to other storms over the past hundred years if sea level had been the same every year? So in other words, if that annual sea level curve were flat over the past hundred years, and I can just read what I wrote here, but this total still water level, so not including waves, which I'll get to on the next slide, um, on January 10th was severe, so a five to 25 year return period, but not as extreme as the 100 year event or the event that has a 1% chance of occurring in any year that we often plan for. But in some areas, so for example, in Southern Maine, the January 13th event really was extreme and kind of on par with the blizzard of 78. So a kind of key point to make here is that there's been a whole cluster of extreme flood events, including these January events, since 2018 in the Northeast. And that's the impact of just seven and a half inches of sea level rise. Um, and so what should stand out is that at this moment, it's really important to carefully consider what the impact of several feet over the rest of the century might be. So th the last thing Jen had asked about was the impact of um, each element of the storm, and can you flip the slide one more time? 
So Susie already did a great job kind of touching on this, but this diagram is showing that, you know, like if there's the average that water level is all the time, there are several elements or physical drivers that cause water level to go up and down around that average. And so all the way on the left, we already talked about how sea level can make water level go up compared to the average. Then as you all know, on top of that, tides cause water level to go up and down 10 to 20 feet, depending on where you are, twice a day. And then even on top of that, sustained onshore winds during a storm drive what we call storm surge. In Maine, storm surge is generally smaller than the tide. And so, as you all likely know, how bad flooding is has a lot to do with what the high tide happens to be on the day that a surge occurs and what the timing of the peak surge is relative to high tide within the day. And like Susie showed, January 10th was an example of a relatively moderate tide combining with a pretty extreme surge, whereas January 13th was the opposite. The tide was higher and the surge was lower, but combined, we still got a really high water level. And then particularly for those of you who are on exposed coastlines, you know that waves are what can really, or sort of the short-term rise and fall of water level is what really can cause damage. And in part because of the southeast wind direction and how exposed southeast facing parts of the main coastline are to open ocean, um, wave heights were really extreme um, during particularly the Wednesday event. Um, and then kind of the last element that Susie also already touched on that I want to mention is that warmer temperatures that were much more likely because of climate change caused freshwater flooding and rain flooding to have a really big impact during these events. So whereas normally these events had been occurring like at times where temperatures were below freezing, so you wouldn't have melting snow and high river flows, we had both, particularly on Wednesday. So in communities that are on tidal rivers, like Machias, you had both flooding coming from the ocean and high river flow coming from inland that combined to create really high water level. And then sort of another effect that we saw mostly in urban areas, so this was going on in Portland, particularly during the Saturday storm, um, high coastal water levels were blocking storm drain outfalls. And then because it was also warm enough to be raining, we got two inches of rain that just backed up through storm drains and flooded a lot of our major roadways. All right, and that is all I have on that piece. Thank you so much for that, Hannah. That was really helpful, bringing all these elements together. Um, it's really just a matter of how they mix together at any given storm. We've heard a lot, Susie, lately about storms changing and how they may be changing over time here in Maine. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and Emma, you can flip to the next slide. Um, a lot of this slide and this information comes straight from our Maine state climatologist, Sean Burkle. So I wanted to just put that right out there. Um, so it's a great question. We've been hearing it a lot. Um, climate attribution to specific events is really difficult. Um, so I can tell you what we do know about how climate impacts storm trends here in Maine. And then uh, um, maybe I'm actually gonna start with what we what we don't quite know yet. So um, throwing out right away that clearly more investigation is needed to understand these historical events, as well as making projections going forward particularly around the frequency and intensity. We hear that in the media a lot, um, uh, especially around frequency of storms. The There's a lot more work to be done. If you look at, for example, um, future trends for extra tropical storms in the region, those studies actually suggest that in a warming climate, these events will become less frequent, but more intense with greater precipitation amounts. And that's what I'll be getting into in this slide here. Um, also wanted to put a plug in um, that I'll, Sean is working on analysis of historical storms in Maine right now. And we're hoping to have a, a call out box on this exact topic in our scientific and technical subcommittees update, which is due out um, in a month or two. So we can certainly make that available once that analysis is complete. Um, what, what we do know from the literature is Maine's climate is getting wetter um, Hannah mentioned this. This is one of those um, uh, factors that's really impacting um, inland and coastal flooding. So we're seeing heavy precipitation events becoming more common in Maine and the Northeast region associated with uh, um, the warming climate. 
and its impacts on the hydrologic cycle. Um, there's been a recent study of fall uh, windstorms, those with gusts over 58 miles per hour, and, and uh, that did indeed find that more precipitation is accompanying these storms. But again, there was no significant trend in so storm frequency or wind intensity for that period, that 40 year period. Um, people have been asking why we're getting more storms from the Southeast wind direction. Um, the short answer is we don't really know. Um, what we can say is that the reason why the the winds are coming from the Southeast is based on the, the storm track coming from the Southwest in that kind of um, uh, counterclockwise rotation of those storms is bringing the winds uh, up into the coast of Maine from that from the from the southeast direction. So um, why that's happening, we're not quite sure why we're seeing more of it. Um, but that's the reason it has to do with the storm track as to why the winds are coming from the southeast. So maybe not a satisfying answer for everyone who who wants to really pinpoint exactly why this is happening and what we can expect, but that's where the state of the science is in a nutshell. Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Hannah, for that uh, science overview. So Gabe, let's turn to you now. So how do you help communities prepare for coastal flooding? Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, First, I'll say we use the science. Um, so my work is in long-term planning and it definitely is dependent on the science. So my job really is uh, working with communities. And as you mentioned in the, in the intro, you know, mostly uh, coastal communities. So looking um, at the science um, and helping communities make informed decisions about how to address priorities that they've identified. So if we're looking at, like, just say flood hazards and mitigation, so we take the most accurate scientific data, which is, you know, what Susie and Hannah are sharing, and then combine that with local knowledge. So, you know, maybe it's historic uh, knowledge, it's cultural, it's social, what's the anecdote? what have people observed, you know, what have people documented in that community? Um, and then also to really, um, help communities understand what their values are. So like, what? how do we prioritize things? What are of most value to us? Because a lot of these um, decisions uh, uh, that we're doing in long-term planning, you know, we have to make decisions about how to act. Um, it's not an emergency management response, it's a long-term plan. And so for that, we need a vision. So it really is helping communities like assess their values and ground that vision um, uh, you know, make sure that vision is based in their values. So, you know, one of my pri primary projects right now, um, as you mentioned in the outset, is uh, serving as one of the regional coordinators for Maine's Community Resilience Partnership. And through that work, um, the communities that I am assisting, they're they're taking a lot of different uh, flood. If we're just using flooding as a as an example, flood preparedness um, actions in relation to planning. And I'll I'll talk about some of those in a little bit greater detail uh, later on. But, you know, most of the things that they're undertaking, you know, they're, they're, they're looking at their vulnerabilities, sort of like, you know, where are we uh, vulnerable to flooding? You know, is it, um, you know, roadways? Is it infrastructure? Are there people that are, are more vulnerable? Um, so really assessing those vulnerabilities and how how they're going to go about how that community is going to go about addressing those vulnerabilities. And I mentioned sort of these difficult decisions. There might be difficult decisions around, you know, how where, what infrastructure do we invest in? Um, you know, what targets are we going to use? Hannah mentioned the main won't wait um, elevation uh, targets. Um, so, you know, are we going to raise something four feet? What are the budget impacts for that? How do we fund these adaptations? Um, things like land conservation for uh, buffers um, from coastal storms. You know, do we need to conserve more land? Is there more land to conserve? Um, so a lot of it has to do with like integrating um, adaptation uh, plans into uh, capital improvement cycles and capital improvement plans. And then, you know, it, a lot of it does come down to, um, yes, our community values, but then, you know, making decisions around uh, funding. And we're in a time right now where we're seeing, 
a lot of uh, funding for resilience and uh, climate adaptation, as well as mitigation, which is great. Um, but we have to be prepared to take advantage of that funding. And there are a lot of factors that go into being able to take advantage of that funding. So, um, and I might say more about that later. All right, thank you, Gabe. So what tools, just thinking about the tools and data that are available to communities to do planning, Hannah and Susie, can you address some of those? Yeah, so in terms of planning tools, I often think of um, kind of short term tools. So uh, preparing for upcoming events and then longer term tools for planning that support decision making, like how high do I need to install this furnace? Should I rebuild here? And in the short term, the National Weather Service is um, puts out a really fantastic flood forecast that is key to follow. And um, we'll follow up with links that include information about the various options for accessing the forecast. But here I just pulled a screenshot example from the NWS Gray's, NWS Gray Office's coastal flood forecasting page. So if you click on any of these points where there's a forecast, it'll tell you uh, over the next few high tides um, or the next few days of high tides, how high water level is expected to get. And um, my organization, for example, is working with the National Weather Service to expand the number of flood forecasting points that are out there by um, installing tide gauges in communities that they can use to essentially validate their modeled forecast. So a key thing here is like when you read a number like 11 point, the, you know, the high tide will reach 11.2 feet mean lower low water is being able to translate that to this propane tank on my pier might start floating this dumpster might floating, might start floating. We need to move the cars that are parked in these spots. Um, and that's a key challenge that we're like very aware of and trying to push out tools that will um, kind of support those sorts of decision-making uh, processes. Um, so can you please flip to the next slide? So another really great tool that um, we're looking, uh, Pete Slavinsky from the Maine Geological Survey and I are hoping to take some steps in the near term to modify to support planning. Um, are, is the main geological survey sea level rise and storm surge tool. So right now you can click these various scenarios um, on the right hand side. And again, we'll follow up providing a link and then it maps the depth of water that that translates to um, over coastal land areas. A little bit of a challenge with this right now is if you read these numbers, so highest astronomical tide plus 1.6 feet, that water level is hard to connect to a tide prediction or to a National Weather Service forecast because those are in feet mean lower low water. And so that's a key update we would like to make to this system. And there's sort of the second question of um, what does that water level mean in terms of risk? Like, is this extreme? Is this routine? Um, and when should we pre be prepared for this sort of a water level? Is this reflecting current sea level conditions, future sea level conditions? Um, and that is all information that we um, hope to be able to add to this tool in the near future. Emma, you can move to the next slide. Uh, Hannah, I'm so excited for uh, you and Pete Slavinsky's work to, to create that, that new user-friendly tool that takes a lot of the confusion out of how to prepare. Um, I'm just going to share two more tools um, one is more of a long-term planning tool, and the next is more of a, um, a short-term um, look at, at accessibility. So this tool here is all about the, the FEMA flood maps. Um, that's a long-term tool. You can zoom in using the Maine's flood hazard map tool. You could just Google that and go right there, put in your um, your your town or even your address, and um, basically get an understanding of whether you fall in a floodplain and, and and which zone that you fall in. So what I've done here is zoomed in uh, to, to my town of Bath. Um, and what you're seeing here is downtown Bath uh, is in a zone or much of it is in zone um, AE. Uh, so this is like still water if you're in a V zone. Um, that would be standing for velocity and you'd be at a higher uh, higher risk. But so these flood maps are a, 
uh, kind of a where the regulatory's um, regulatory rubber hits the road. Um, so it's a good idea to have an understanding of how to read a flood map. And one of the things that the that I think has come from these storms is the need around training to use some of these tools that exist. So we're especially grateful to Hannah and Pete for simplifying some things going forward. Um, but these flood hazard maps can give you a first look of whether you fall in the floodplain of a 100 year storm. And that's what's shown here in blue. The two stars that I've pointed out here are where I took pictures on um, on the Saturday event, just to, to get a sense of how accurate the flood map was in, in my neighborhood. And it turns out, so the picture on the upper right uh, was taken where the the higher yellow st star is, so it's it's quite accurate. Uh, the second picture of the parking lot was taken further down where that other yellow star is, and it looked like the hundred year floodplain extended out a little further than what I witnessed on on Saturday, but it was um, it was pretty close to to being right on. Um, and so I know that there's efforts to do similar thing, kind of match up what we're seeing in in real time with. Uh, what we're being shown on these um, these flood maps. So another tool, if you could move to the next slide, please, is one that was put out oh, probably five, six years ago from the Nature Conservancy. Um, this is called the Coastal Risk Explorer. And why I highlight this is because preparedness is more about thinking that, about just your piece of property and whether you're getting wet or not. Um, um, it's also too important. It's, it's also important to consider accessibility, or in this case, inaccessibility, um, which is a threat that impacts far number, uh, far greater number of people than just those whose property is getting wet. So, how this tool works is you can you can toggle um, basically different sea level rise scenarios. You can see here on the left, I've toggled over to two feet. This can also be a proxy for storm surge. So you can imagine um, this would be. Uh, fairly accurate for predicting flooding during a storm event that had a two foot surge. Um, so I'm not able to operate the pointer, but on the upper part of the of, of the map, you're seeing a little red section of road. At, this is Arousic at the top of Arousic. And that's a small section of marsh that with two feet of, of flooding, it becomes inundated. And the repercussions of that is that not only is all of Arousic blocked off um, because there's one in, there's one way in and one way out, but all of the residences in Georgetown are are blocked off. And the, one of the main points of this tool is highlighting number of res residences that are um, inaccessible to emergency services during flood events. So this would be an important tool to have awareness of when you're commuting, when you're busing students, and certainly if there's an emergency where an ambulance needed to come down a road that was not passable. So a good thing to have in the back of your mind around uh, preparedness planning. And the other thing that I'm gonna leave to Gabe to talk a little bit about is you, it gets cut off at the bottom of my screen, but this is a tool that also talks about the social vulnerability of communities on top of um, their flood risk. So looking at the whole package of kind of a, a, a community's ability to respond from a vulnerability perspective. Great. Thanks, Susie. Thanks, Hannah, for those tools and a, sort of a preview of what is to come. So, Gabe, in light of the tools that we have in hand now and the ones that are currently being developed, how can communities use these tools to be prepared and build resilience for coastal flooding? Yeah, thanks, Jen. And I'm going to talk a little bit about community tools and MFU switch to the next slide, I'm going to highlight some of those. But, you know, what, what we're seeing in the tools that um, uh, Hannah and Susie presented were, you know, we can see what's going to happen. And then we need to determine in our community, how are we going to be impacted? So we use these tools in long term planning to uh, do these assessments and, and figure out, um, you know, what are the impacts from these hazards? You know, how do we make decisions based on what we know the impacts are? So, um, you know, just thinking about really understanding um, what our vulnerabilities are in the community and how we're going to address those vulnerabilities. I mean, I think hopefully most folks um, are are uh, aware of 
uh, a county hazard uh, mitigation plan. Maybe your town has a local hazard mitigation plan, but really that's a plan that's going to assess uh, your risk to natural hazards. And it's going to uh, define what some strategies are to mitigate those uh, those hazards. So again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we're using whatever the current data is, we're using local history, we're using community knowledge, and we're designing some mitigation strategies. So people are going to be familiar with these. These are your like ordinances, your regulations, your building codes, it might be the adaptation of uh, infrastructure you're elevating, you might be retrofitting, you might be relocating, you might be like, this is not a place for this road, or this is not a good place to have this infrastructure. You might be uh, looking at um, natural solutions like a buffer, a floodplain, a wetland. Um, and then another important element of this planning is around outreach and education to the public. And this is this is the work that um, our local emergency management agencies uh, re, uh, countywide and statewide are conducting. In fact, the state just uh, put out a new 2023 hazard mitigation uh, plan. So, you know, that's one way we're taking the information from these tools and communities are are using it to to become more uh, prepared and uh, ready to um, respond uh, when when there is um, uh, an imp impacts from from uh, uh, coastal hazards and and climate hazards. And another tool that communities are using um, more frequently with climate um, adaptation and mitigation is really to uh, do a community vulnerability assessment. and and that's really looking at how vulnerable, are we in our built environments, our social environments, our natural systems, and uses the same sort of uh, premise. We're gonna we're gonna look at data, we're gonna look at history, we're gonna look at local knowledge, and we're gonna see how at risk we are. But this is this dies a little bit deeper in some ways, where we're saying, you know, not only how are we gonna be impacted by these hazards, how are we gonna respond, but we kind of look across the whole community. And Susie mentioned the social vulnerability component. And I just wanted to take a second to, to look at that because when we're be being, getting prepared as communities, whether it's short-term or long-term, not everyone has the ability to respond in the same way. And there are a lot of factors that influence that and not everyone is impacted in the same way. So if you could just flip to the next slide real quick, I'll just um, share a little bit so in Maine, we really focus on what's called the Maine Social Vulnerability Index, and that's a percentile ranking of vulnerability. It's calculated by Census Block Group, and it's based on socioeconomic and demographic factors. And you can see some of these here. Um, so really, in a community vulnerability assessment, we're using uh, this quantitative and qualitative data to understand our community social vulnerability. So when we look through that social vulnerability lens, um, we're really seeing how different populations within our community are going to be impacted and how um, people are able to respond or not able to respond. And based on that information, we can then um, design strategies that are going to, with people that are going to be impacted and in ways that will work um, to mitigate those impacts. So if you go to the next slide, I just wanted to share real quick, because this will be relevant to our uh, coastal communities, is that um, the Equity uh, Maine Climate Council Equity Subcommittee has identified what we're calling priority populations. So when we're doing this work in our communities, not only are we looking at social vulnerability, but we're saying there are particular populations in our community based on different factors that will be able to, um, that will be more impacted by climate um, hazards and will therefore, you know, will need to be more considered around how we are going to uh, design strategies to respond to those um, hazards. So you'll see like rural communities, uh, small towns, limited staff capacity towns, climate frontline uh, communities, that's like, you know, right on the coast, uh, natural resource industry um, workers, so fishing communities. So all of these communities that we we work with along the, uh, the coast and the islands are definitely most impacted. So if you go to the next slide, um, a couple of the other tools um, that communities are taking the science and using the tools that um, 
Susie and Hannah uh, mentioned, and they're they're employing them in different ways. Um, some are, you know, some are doing community planning exercises. Um, that might be like an emergency management tabletop exercise or scenario planning type exercise. There are a couple of great tools that a lot of our communities are using. Uh, one is the uh, main flood resilience checklist, which is really uh, a way for communities to just focus on uh, flood vulnerability and like wh where where are roads inundated. Um, Susie mentioned uh, emergency uh, management decisions based around the uh, TNC tool. Well, that's really like the, the main flood re resilience checklist looks at that, you know, who's cut off during a storm, who's on oxygen and, you know, won't won't have electricity. How do we get to them if the road is flooded? Um, planning forward is another great tool, which is like a values based planning tool that communities are using from this is a tool from the um, uh, Gulf of Maine Research Institute and the Island Institute. Um, that's a great way for communities to just kind of look at, um, you know, what are some real time decisions um, that uh, sort of day to day um, things that municipalities are challenged with in the face of uh, climate change. So that's a, another great thing. And then I just think um, these the tools that um, Susie and Hannah presented um, are, are going to so like, how do we increase our knowledge about what's happening in the world around us in terms of weather, in terms of climate, in terms of how we're going to be impacted. So just ac across the board, increasing your local knowledge in your community, um, you might be, you know, might be a storm readiness program. Um, there are different things from the National Weather Service that people can engage in. There are a lot of early warning systems that communities use. It might be uh, something on Facebook, hey, this is happening, might be a phone tree, it might be text alerts, citizen pro science uh, projects, Hannah mentioned this, a lot of communities are collecting local data, they're, they're saying what's happening in our community, whether it's tide uh, level monitoring, whether it's um, weather monitoring, um, whether it's through observation or co actually collecting some uh, numbers, um, and then uh, a lot of local um, groups, committees, whether they're municipal or grassroots, are using these tools to help inform other members of the community, help inform the municipality about how to make uh, uh, some of these difficult decisions, uh, like what's going to happen and and how do we decide um, how to allocate resources. And I think the last way, um, you know, we're seeing, or I'll say the last way, but the last way I'm going to mention today, because there's certainly many different things, um, is... Um, you know, just overall community resilience building. And we're seeing this in a variety of different ways. It might be communities looking at these tools and then making capital improvement decisions. You know, what are we gonna, how are we gonna adapt our infrastructure and when? Uh, what, which bridge is most vulnerable? Which roadway is most vulnerable? Um, so prioritizing based on a capital improvement cycle. Um, and then thinking about um, how are we communicating with our communities members about what's happening? Um, that's definitely a resilience building tool that's so consistent, um, equitable outreach and engagement. How are we involving people in decision making? What type of information are we sharing with communities? And then I, I I would be remiss if I didn't make a plug for the Community Resilience Partnership just as a planning tool itself, because that enables communities, especially ones who have not had any um, access to planning um, or experience with planning, it gives communities a, a way to um, assess their vulnerabilities in a, in a simple way, and um, also then to prioritize um, how they want to address those vulnerabilities. So a lot of different uh, ways people are taking existing tools and using them, but also um, a bunch of different uh, tools that other tools that communities are using. Thank you so much for that, Gabe. And thanks to all of our panelists uh, for all of the information around the science and the planning for coastal flooding. I know that Gabe needs to go jump on another probably go help a community with some planning, but Susie and Hannah are going to stick around for some Q&A. So please use the um, Q&A box to ask some questions. So there are questions coming in, Hannah and Susie, and both of you are serving in various roles on the Maine Climate Council. 
how is are these storms, the December storm, the January storms, informing the work on the Climate Council? I can I can take a first stab at that. Um, um, as many of you may know, the governor hosts these three storm events called a meeting of a special meeting of the Maine Climate Council that was held a week ago uh, today, actually, up in Augusta to talk about how to improve Maine's resilience in the face of these more extreme events. Um, so there was a lot of um, brainstorming that happened following the presentations and the, the panelists um, recounting of impacts that they felt on their on their communities. Um, one thing, uh, so I'll, first I'll maybe touch on a, a, a personal note that I hope to influence at the Climate Council, and then I'll uh, just summarize three outcomes that I heard loud and clear at that meeting. Um, the one that I really feel passionately about is the need to, to highlight um, the need for better communication of the science that we have already to inform preparedness and in general, um, improve communication across all levels. So from state government to county to municipalities in order to improve coordination around these, these severe events. So one is just um, making that science accessible to more people. And the second is using that science um, to help us be more coordinated. Um, other things that came out of the meeting um, was the need, something that we've been talking about already today, is the need to provide um, easier tools and guidance of how to use these tools to, to calculate future water, water levels, um, and then pair that with the development of protocols for before, during, and after these emergency events. Um, another big theme was the need to re-envision our working waterfronts, um, and how are we going to do that with um, innovative engineering and and how do we do how do we rebuild um, with the the permitting that we have in place now and it's been great to see how nimble the state has been in terms of 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 permitting and the need and balancing the need for working waterfronts to rebuild so that they can be um, be able to fish um, when the the lobster season really kicks off in a couple months and the last thing that came out loud and clear was a focus on mental health. It's not something we've really talked about much today, but um, climate has been identified um, as one thing that's contributing to declining mental health of, of patients, of physicians in Maine. So there's Maine specific data pointing to the link between mental health impacts and climate anxiety and, and, other, um, and other climate impacts for folks. So those are just three real quick things that came out of the meeting and then a, and then a personal goal for me. Thank you, Susie. Uh, Hannah, I think this next question might be a good one for you to address. So specifically, what are the factors that contribute to storm surge? Is it just pressure, low pressure, or are there other variables? Um, Jennifer, actually, before I answer that question, I just want to like double down on something Susie said, and particularly because of some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, and Joseph has like said it perfectly that this is all helpful information, but this is complicated. And how do I actually figure out in a simple digestible way what this means for me? And this is something that um, us who work on this in Maine have been talking about for a couple of years now, like how do we make this information more digestible? And um, I just say that these recent events lining up with the timing of releasing the updated um, report as part of the Maine Climate Council has just really made us double down on that effort to get better information out soon. Um, we really, really do hear that challenge from you. And part of the challenge is that there really currently is no perfect tool to combine all that information. Actually, like scientifically, it's really hard to put all these pieces together. So we're going to do our best in the near term. But then looking out a little bit longer term. Um, you all might have heard about this, but Maine DOT is funding the development of a model. Um, it, it'll be called the Maine Coastal Flood Risk Model that's slated to come out in late 2025. And that will combine all these different factors like waves and surge and sea level rise and tides to give you sort of just a unified view where you can zoom in on your pier, your um, your business, your house, and or like the roads in your neighborhood and see you know, this is the percent chance that you see a water level like this in this year. And that'll really support kind of some of that 
um, like longer term decision making we've been talking about. Okay, so just wanted to say I, I hear that challenge and we're working on it. Um, and okay, so you also asked about uh, pressure versus winds for storm surge. So there are, there are two factors that contribute to storm surge. One is that during these storms, we often um, see low pressure. And when pressure is lower, water level rises because there's less air pushing down on it, literally. Um, and the second effect is just persistent onshore winds, literally piling water up at the coast. The um, the the effect of the of wind is almost always greater than the effect of pressure, um, although the effect of pressure is not insignificant. And then, kind of the the third thing that controls storm surge is what the shape is of the coastline that you're on. So if you're in a narrow embayment, or if you're in kind of a, an embayment, those sorts of features can really kind of funnel water and make it higher as it gets pushed into shore. Whereas if you're on more of a um, arced open coastline, surge is not quite as high. Thank you for that. There's a lot of questions about the FEMA 100 year flood maps. And if we could just start with like a basic thing, you know, I've heard about these FEMA flood, 100 year flood maps for a very long time, right? That's our insurance is all based on that. Is that terminology getting updated with climate? Is that still meaningful right now? And how do we interpret that? Maybe I'll start, Susie, and then pass it over to you. So um, maybe just to talk about the terminology of a 100 year flood. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that's a little bit of a misnomer. So um, what it really is, it's the flood that has a 1% chance of occurring in a given year. And when you're thinking about risk, you usually are worried about risk over the lifetime of your mortgage or the lifetime of your the furnace or the heat pump. And so over a 30 year period, if we just take the mortgage example, the chance of seeing the 1% annual chance flood or the 100 year flood is actually close to 30%. So that's kind of a, and that's if sea level were not changing. So the other piece there, and maybe Susie, I can pass it to you to talk about sea level rise and FEMA flood maps. Yeah, so I'm not a flood map expert, but I, I have um, I, I have recently been paying a little bit more attention to them. Um, flood maps don't account for future condi conditions of flood hazards. Um, so they're not taking into account sea level rise. Um, I don't remember exactly what the specific question was, but um, I saw one in the chat around uh, finding out what your base flood elevation is. And Hannah, this is a question that I also had was, you know, when you look at some of the maps, it, you're, you see, you know, the V zone stands for the, the zones with moving water and takes into account waves. But then sometimes you have the E alongside the V and there is an elevation listed. Um, and same for, for the A zones, which is, um, you know, a little bit less vulnerable where you can expect to see standing water, it, uh, during that 100 year storm. But the same thing goes for the, sometimes the elevation is there, um, and sometimes it's not. And my understanding was that it had to do with, um, the date of the flood map or the date that it was, that it was created. If it was created back in the eighties, you don't see the, the base flood elevation. Um, whereas if they've been updated, then you are more likely to see that elevation. But maybe you can clarify if you know more. Yeah, I actually don't know more than that, but it's so great that these questions are getting asked because as we start to push out these tools, we will um, we will do the research and try to clarify. So keep those questions coming. I love, Hannah, that you're talking about creating more simplified ways for people to find out this information and how it's going to directly impact them. And actually, there's a question here in um, that talks about how people can contribute. And the question is specifically, how do I monitor, mo uh, monitor my tide level? How do I do it? What equipment do I need? But I'd love for you to also talk about how people can contribute or communities could contribute to that effort. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll kind of get to both, but I'll do them backwards. So how communities can contribute. Um, you remember when I was showing the National Weather Service forecast and it said, you know, water level will reach 10.4 feet mean lower low water. And we really want to give the National Weather Service information that allows them to say, and that means there will be water here and here and here, or this is how severe the impact is. That comes from boots on the ground observations during high waters of what the actual impacts are. So 
Um, GMRI has a coastal flooding community science program where um, any community member can go out and follow a protocol we developed with the National Weather Service to make observations of flood impacts during um, during these storms and then submit them to a database. And we're currently working on building a tool that will help emergency managers and national and, and forecasters kind of compile all that information to improve forecasts. So uh, we will share that link when we follow up um, with a whole bunch of resources. And then in terms of um, monitoring your own water levels, kind of the best thing to do is find the nearest NOAA tide prediction station and look at what tide predictions are there. I recognize that they're often not all that accurate, and that is something that um, we're working with. There, there are several organizations in the area working on improving kind of the spatial coverage and accuracy of water level monitoring in Maine. And do you want to talk about the Hohonu tide trackers? And so, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So we, we've established or we've um, installed four new tide gauges. Um, tide gauges are much, they're the devices that actually measure coastal, coastal water level. And um, there are a whole bunch of new sort of low cost options out there, which anyone kind of could look into to put on their own pier. Um, and, but it does, they are a little bit uh, difficult to install and maintain. So I don't know that I would kind of like recommend that for, for everybody to do, but. Right, your uh, municipality, maybe not your your personal. Your yeah, personal. yeah. Um, so yeah, we've been installing these lower cost sensors. And so far we've put them in um, Machias, Booth Bay Harbors, Port Clyde and, um, and Portland. Um, and those are, it's an example of a way that you can improve your local tide predictions and your local forecast and have measurements during extreme events to connect to observations that community members might be making. Lots of questions about how to interpret the maps and stuff. So I can actually see that having some more interpretation friendly tools will be so important moving forward. Um, what about tide predictions moving forward? Is there any new development about how to better predict tides in any particular area? Um, just Jen, real quick, before we get to that question, which I'm definitely punting to Hannah, um, around interpreting FEMA flood maps, we do have that expertise in the state for sure. Um, Sue Baker was on main calling the other day talking about FEMA flood maps, um, She's from the Office of Floodplain Management, I think is the name of the office. Um, and so certainly there are resources um, available in the state, but we can definitely do a better job collectively at making those more accessible and understandable to people. Thanks, Susie. Yeah, that's a really important point that we only represent like a, a small slice of the expertise available in the state on this call. Um, oh, Hannah, I just mm -hmm. want to... I want to clarify that question about the tides, especially with regard to this tidal cycling, this up and down. Like, what is the science on understanding that and if we're still going up or coming down? Oh, yeah. So this is something that we will write about in the main Climate Council report that is going to come out. But um, the height the tide range, so how high high tide is and how low low tide is, that varies naturally. Like day to day, we have one tide cycle with a larger tide range, one with a smaller one, but then monthly, that's spring and neap tides, but also on decadal time scales. So every 18.6 years, tide range gets bigger and then it gets smaller. So you have a decade where tides are larger than average, followed by a decade where tides are smaller than average. And that just is related to like natural planetary cycles. It's not related to climate change. Um, right now, we are at the minimum of that cycle. So tide range is smaller than average, or we're going to reach that the sort of bottom of that cycle in about the next year. And then tide range is going to start increasing again over the next decade. So for the last 10 years, a smaller than average tide range has been counteracting the increase in flood hazard from rising sea level. And that's going to flip in about a year where tides getting bigger is going to combine with sea level rise, essentially just to increase the odds. You know, it's all about probability, just increase the odds that we could get another to get get a large flood event. 
And with the new Maine Climate Council report, we're going to be putting out um, statistics that show here's how the like the 10% and the 1% annual chance event are expected to vary in the future. And you'll see that in the next decade, it's the, the water level is going to increase fast, and then it'll plane off, and then it'll increase faster, and then it'll kind of plane off. And so that'll, that'll all be available um, when the new report comes out. Thank you for that. So I just, there's questions that um, we're going to be um, sending an email to all of you after this is over. And we're going to put links in that email to resources to help you see the data, help you interpret the data. And all of your questions are so great because it's helping inform us what kind of information is needed. I mean, this is great to have Hannah on this call who is creating tools to help interpret this kind of data. And the Island Institute is very much interested in helping to communicate and simplify all of the scientific expertise on this realm. So this is um, webinar two in a series that we will be continuing to help understand coastal flooding. So thank you to Hannah and Susie and Gabe for your time today and your expertise. Thanks to everyone who asked great questions. Thank you. Uh, be on the lookout for an email, follow-up email from us. This has been recorded, so you can go back and watch it later or share it with whomever you like. And stay tuned because we are going to be putting together more webinars on this topic and related topics around resilience. Next up, we're going to focus specifically on rebuilding and resilience on the coast and what that looks like. So thank you all so much for participating and have a great day.